Major sponsors for Ableton On Air include Green Mountain Support Services, empowering people with disabilities to live home in the community, Washington County Mental Health, where hope and support come together. Media sponsors for Ableton On Air include Parkchester Times, Muslim Community Report, www.thisisthebronx.info, Associated Press Media Editors, New York Parrot Online Newspaper, U.S. Press Corps Domestic and International, Anchor FM, and Spotify. Partners for Ableton On Air include Yihad of New York and New England, where everyone belongs, the Orthodox Union, the Division for the Blind and Visually Impaired of Vermont, the Vermont Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired, Central Vermont Habitat for Humanity, and Montpelier Sustainable Coalition, Montefiore Medical Center of the Bronx, Rose F. Kennedy Center of Bronx, New York, Albert Einstein College of Medicine of the Bronx. Able Then On Air has been seen in the following publications. Parchester Times, www.thisisthebronx.com, New York Pirate Online Newspaper, Muslim Community Report, www.h.com, and the Montpelier Bridge. Ableton On Air is part of the following organizations. The National Academy of Television, Arts, and Sciences, Boston, New England chapter, and the Society of Professional Journalists. Welcome to this edition of Ableton On Air, the one and only program that focuses on the needs, concerns, and achievements of the differently able. I've been your host, Lauren Seiler. And on this, uh, before we get to this, um, to this topic today of uh, transportation and micro transportation, uh, let's uh, thank our sponsors: Green Mountain Support Services, Washington County Mental Health, and many others, including the partnership of the Montpelier of, of the Sustainable Montpelier Coalition and many others uh, for helping with the production of Ableton On Air, including the Division for the Blind and the Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired of Vermont. Um, thank you, Elizabeth, for uh, joining us on this. Um, our guest today is Elizabeth Parker from the Sustainable Montpelier Coalition. Thank you again for joining us. Oh, thanks. It's my pleasure to be here, for okay. sure. Okay. Before... And, and, um, and Arlene, I hear you're on the phone. Glad that you're here with us, too. Okay, me too. Okay. I uh, found let, it on. I found it. Okay. Let's um, get into our, our show today. Um, before we get into um, the new happenings of the, of the Sustainable Montpelier Coalition, what is the mission and goals, again, for those that don't know? Of the, of the Sustainable Montpelier Coalition. So the Sustainable Montpelier Coalition came out of the uh, 2030 uh, Sustainable Montpelier Design Competition, which was held in 2000, uh, gosh, 2017. And uh, it was uh, a wonderful competition where uh, design groups from all over the world, from Europe and Africa and Asia and the United States, all uh, submitted plans of what Montpelier would look like if all of our 60% of our downtown parking were housing, commercial space, or, or uh, third space, green space for mm -hmm. the community to use. And so um, out of that, uh, the entries from that competition, uh, we had uh, some suggestions, one of which was re think reimagining transportation. Um, and uh, shifting land use so that we would have the parking lots would be turned into housing and commercial space and green space. And also, since COVID, uh, we've been working on community engagement through the Capital Area Neighborhood uh, Coalitions. Okay. Co you said Capital Area Coalition. So what is that? What does that encompass? So Capital Area Neighborhoods was started almost 12 years ago 
uh, during one of another economic downturn. And so when we had been talking about it, Mayor Ann and, and Sustainable Montpelier had been talking about it, it was originally an initiative started by uh, Mary Hooper when she was mayor. Uh, and it, it worked for a while, but then didn't have any administrative support, so it sort of dipped. And when COVID came along, Mayor Ann was like, we really need to energize this ne these networks again. So there used to be 12 uh, neighborhoods across Montpelier. And um, uh, Sustainable Montpelier jumped in to help organize. And we realized that, that according to the zoning map now, there are 50 neighborhoods. And that, that neighborhoods self-identify in smaller groups than what had been there before. So there are now 20 neighborhoods throughout Montpelier organized by 30 um, uh, volunteer coordinators. Mm -hmm. and, so uh, no one gets paid. Hmm? No one gets paid. It's not a it's not a paid position. No, it's not a paid position for them. Um, and so, what we do uh, at Sustainable Montpelier is we. Um, so Hanif Nazarali is the new uh, liaison for for the capital area neighborhoods, and um, he crafts a newsletter at least once or sometimes twice a month that he sends out to the thirty coordinators, and then they have a network that they send this newsletter out, and it's got all sorts of information about events, uh, different messages from the city. Uh, and we, there are 15 uh, community partners, mm. so uh, that's one thing. And then, uh, f for the first time during this past election, uh, the Mountain View uh, Capital Area Neighborhood, uh, Peter Kelman asked for a District 3 uh, candidates forum, and I don't know if you had a chance to watch that. You're not in District 3 yourself, so you probably didn't. But um, uh, the four candidates who were running for the district, the two District 3 uh, positions, had an amazing um, hour and a half discussion uh, moderated by the former executive director of the Kelly Copper Library, Tom McC McKeon. And um, it was just fabulous. They talked about all sorts of Montpelier issues, and so that's the first of four uh, forums that we will help uh, organize this year. Um, and it is really up to the capillary neighborhoods uh, or the city to request uh, a forum. Now let's talk about um, uh, micro transit mm -hmm. and you know the importance of now big cities like New York and Boston have bigger transit situations and right. also bigger stresses with um, the situation with transit. So explain this article in Bloomberg and how it came about. Yeah, so um, a, a reporter who, um, who writes for uh, Bloomberg Online uh, got in touch with us uh, to talk about uh, My Ride by GMT, which is the microtransit pilot project that started uh, June 4th uh, in 20, 2021, yeah, <laughs> get my numbers straight here. Mm. So it's been running for um, about 15 months now. Uh, and is, this is the first time that microtransit has been piloted in a uh, city under 10,000 people. And uh, so the reporter was really interested in how it was working for us. He uh, interviewed a couple of other transit specialists, uh, and may I add, both of them were not very supportive of microtransit, uh, so it gave well, a little why bit. Why is that? Um, because I, I just I think it's their personal opinion. Uh, I think it's really hard. Public transportation used to be uh, privately owned, and then it became uh, government-run organizations. And there's what we call traditional transportation, which is fixed route, fixed schedule buses, which is what you have a lot in larger urban areas like, like New, New York, York and Boston. Uh, and that makes sense because you have a larger population, so it makes sense to be going across down certain corridors that are popular and, you know, on a regular a schedule. Uh, however, because of the population density in Montpelier, it doesn't always make sense to have fixed route schedules. And so um, 
what we did with this pilot project uh, back uh, in January of 2021 was to take three fixed route, fixed schedule bus routes and shift them to this on-demand system. So now there are three buses that are going around Montpelier and there are a couple of ways that people can request a ride. And call, so you have to call. there's a calling, uh, the, um, the GMT call center, which, oh my God, I'm going to have to just look it up just a moment. It's 802. Uh, just a moment while I find it. I can't believe I don't have it up here. Do you have it there? 802-223-7287. Yes, you got it. Okay, I was going to say that, but if I said it wrong. So 802-223-7287. That's one option. And that's an option... Right. And so that's an option for people who don't have uh, a smartphone or uh, a laptop. The other option is there's a URL that you can go to um, and you can find it on the GMT website on the MyRide page. You can go to a URL, use your laptop and get into the MyRide app there and request a ride. And then the other option is for anybody who has a smartphone that you can download an app either on uh, you know, Android or Apple and use that app to call a ride. Uh, so whereas uh, with fixed route, fixed schedule, you could just go to a bus stop and get on the bus stop, the difference is that with my ride, you actually have to schedule your ride. Mm -hmm. And um, Okay, did you want to start asking questions? Yeah, so my, I'm going to repeat what she said. What if someone doesn't have a computer mm -hmm. or a phone uh, and, or internet um, connection? Connection. Yeah, and so that's a really important question. Um, it turns out that in December of 2020, uh, we contacted Vermont, uh, the Disability Rights Vermont, uh, and talked with them about how to give universal access so that anybody who needs a ride can, can schedule a ride. And originally, uh, we thought that it would be good to use tablets at different locations around the city, but Disability Rights Vermont suggested um, what I call a transit phone. It's like a courtesy phone that you would find at an airport where it's like an old-fashioned um, pay phone and you have a uh, you have a, a phone you pick it up and you immediately go to the call center and so that those would be put in key locations um, for instance the transit center downtown uh, at the Berlin Mall uh, and uh, the um, at Price Chopper, at uh, Shaw's, at the um, Maplewood uh, Truck Stop, and uh, and a few other locations, probably the Montpelier Housing Authority locations down t um, in Montpelier. And so that would give people who don't have phones the ability to actually, um, I have my dog with me who's insisting upon it's coming fine. on camera. She could be on the this, show. this is Cece, she's our mascot. Um, and that would allow uh, people who don't have phones to be able to make the calls that they need. And so then they could have that as a, you know, just automatic right. So does that explain, um, yeah. Arlene? But, okay, go ahead. Any more qu questions? Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, in other words, uh, is it possible? The, these buses are small. Right. So is it possible, like, for larger wheelchairs or...? Well, all of the buses that are now running are wheelchair accessible. And so w what is interesting is that there's this whole controversy around uh, the buses that we're, are running now are diesel-based. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a lot of talk about electrification. And one of the quotes I love to use is from the Institute for Transportation and Development Policies and UC Davis, which says that 
uh, communities that engage in electrification and ride sharing can cut their CO2 emissions by 80%. Mm -hmm. so, so everybody's like, electrification, electrification. Well, it turns out that we have a little bit of a bottleneck at the federal level. Not all of the small vans that we would like to use have been approved for public transit. They have to go through rigorous, expensive testing at the federal level before they can be used. So the what we call cutaway buses, the Ford cutaway buses that we use, are on the same chassis that a smaller van would be on mm -hmm. that might be electric down the line. But we're just not at that point. So I encourage people to contact their congressional delegation and ask that the Federal Transportation Authority, uh, you know, test smaller vehicles. Now, you have some, uh, some PowerPoint um, slides right. that you're... When I talk about. Go ahead. I do. And so the PowerPoint slides that I have is just that it with the traditional transportation fixed route fixed schedule, mm -hmm. the buses only went along certain routes. So I have a slide that that um, we can put up now which shows that the areas then, let's put up the slide. Well, I don't think that they have no, it no, right now. No, oh, that's an editing. Right. Okay, good. Yeah. Uh, so they'll, um, and so you'll see that the blue, the yellow, and the red areas on the map are the only place where the bus used to go. So people would have to go to those bus routes in order to get on the bus, which really wasn't very feasible. So what's exciting now is that the entire area of Montpelier and popular areas in Berlin are all accessible by the bus. So the so My Ride bus goes from where to where? It goes from where you are to where you want to go when you want to get there. And so um, it's, but it's within Montpelier and key areas in Berlin are where the, the service area is yeah. now. Yeah, because I know it goes, it goes from, say, Pioneer Apartments to, uh, to Walmart. Yeah, and it goes to uh, some other and Shaw's and and, and, and and but also for medical appointments, it goes to all the different doctor's offices that are up around the hospital. So it's really important for people to be able to have that. Now, part of what the Bloomberg article brought up was that it's after people try out. Uh, microtransit. Sometimes they discover that certain routes uh, need to still be fixed route, fixed schedule um, service. And so there's discussion now of uh, since 40% of the traffic that we're seeing is on the previous Hospital Hill route, which ran from the Lane Shops, Pioneer, uh, through downtown Montpelier, up uh, Berlin Street, to the hospital, to the to Walmart, to Shaw's, and then it would have deviations up there for doctors' offices and whatnot. Forty percent of the current traffic um, is on that schedule. So there's the discussion that after the pilot, that a route would be replaced, and that the other two buses would be used for other types of transportation within Montpelier, and so that's called a hybrid system. Um, it turns out that. Um, that that fixed route, fixed schedule cannot be integrated into the software package. It would be a standalone on its own. Why is that? Um, because uh, it doesn't. It's because it's a different type of function. It doesn't work with the software. So. Now, in the in the other part of the PowerPoint presentation that you're going to show now, in you uh, owning a car or. Three hundred, almost three hundred thousand dollars. Five hundred. Five hundred thousand dollars over the course a, of a lifetime. In the course of a lifetime, how did you guys come up with those numbers? So that's um, some research that was done in Europe, and uh, there was actually, I think it was four hundred and eighty euros, and I put five hundred thousand as a low estimate, but they actually thought it was closer to six hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Per person, is over it depending the on the lifetime. state or the place? No, it's it's just an average. It's a federal average, and and then the other thing that we don't realize about car ownership is that there are hidden costs. Um, the wear and tear on roads is more when you have a lot of individual cars going over those roads than if you had fewer public transit uh, vehicles, mm -hmm. and so the average cost for each 
individual in this country over the course of their lifetime in taxes would be $280,000. And that's for roads and support of the car industry. Um, and so uh, one of the things that uh, you know, people were like, oh my god, Bloomberg said that the cost per ride on my ride is $16.75. And that's so high. And, and of course, what happened was that my ride launched during COVID. So at that time, you know, we could only have four people on the bus at any time. Everybody had to be masked. Uh, and then, you know, in general, people were staying at home and, uh, you know. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's people. why the switch over, because it, from, what, from what I observed is, and probably other people, is that the, before it switched over to my ride, there was like no one on the bus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So is yeah, that yeah. the main reason? Why? Yeah, well, it was it, that we didn't switch over because of that. It just was coincidence that we uh, adopted, you know, launched the my ride service. And at the height of COVID, in that, it, just in that December, January period, where it was like so intense here in Vermont. And so um, the cost, because, okay, so nationally, all public transportation during COVID went way down. It went down all, almost 50%. And so it is believed that it's gonna take another two years for the numbers to come back to what they were pre-COVID. Mm -hmm. um, we've already seen a lot of steady growth with my ride. Every month we have you know, more riders uh, using the service. So that's exciting. And um, you know, one of the goals uh, for us is that we have people who are transit dependent riders. Those are people who don't own cars. I am a transit dependent rider. I have voluntarily chosen for nine years to um, not own a vehicle and to use public transit because I am like a super green person. So you and won't I don't... go in a cab, you won't go in a car? You... Oh, well, I, 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 I don't own a car. I, w I do use cabs occasionally. I use the my ride. Uh, occasionally I rent a car. Uh, I use the train a lot. Um, I use the link to go to Burlington, for instance. So I use public transit uh, or I will rent. Uh, but I don't, the idea of car ownership just isn't something that I believe in. Uh, I don't, I think that we should have access over ownership. Uh, but anyway, uh, the whole thing I'm getting at is that we were talking about the cost of my ride. So of course the, the cost per ride is going to be higher because there are fewer people using the service right now. However, that being said, we used to have a fixed route, fixed schedule uh, bus uh, route, which was called the uh, Capital Shuttle. Mm -hmm. The cost of the ride on the Capital Shuttle was $25 per ride. So sometimes uh, if, a, 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 you know, a service isn't being highly used, it can be very expensive. But I, the reason I talked you know, about car... Also, is it considered a waste of time? Because it, like if no one's using the bus at that time, the driver's just going around and around. Yeah, and around. right. But they're on a fixed route. And so that's one of the other things. But I just want to go back to the cost. So when we talk about the cost you know, being exorbitant for a public transit ride, you ha that's the reason I gave the information about what it costs to use a car and what the hidden tax cost is. So it just lets you use an estimate of $780,000 over the course of a lifetime. When you look at that, and then you realize the fact that the cost per ride, even on a not very often used uh, route like the Capital Shuttle, is still less expensive mm -hmm. than personal ownership. Yeah. Now, uh, the thing is, during the pandemic, GMGA stopped charging. That's right. For rides. Yeah. Okay. 50 cents. Well, if usually people that live in special special housing, they get like uh, they get transit free transit cards. Yes. Right. But normally it's 50 cents per the for, for disabled. Right. And a dollar for no, for regular riders and link buses are different. But is that going to change? Well, there's discussion now, and it's uh, not uh, hasn't been decided. I don't know that its uh, final decision has been made yet. 
However, uh, there's been discussion about keeping the my ride service uh, free of charge, uh, mm. and uh, so you know, as soon as that information comes out, you'll see it uh, publicly in in the paper and um, online. Did Did you want to ask any more questions? Take your time. Take your time. Yeah, the masking. Oh, according yes. According to CDC, according to CDC, from what I've been, as of April 15th, uh, April 18th, excuse me, they're going to make a decision whether or not people have to make wear bus, um, wear masks on buses and planes and. Exactly. So it, I'm, I, I don't know whether it's the 18th or the 14th, but mid-April. Uh, is the is what we know of as the masking deadline at this point, but they're reevaluate on a regular basis. So we know that at least for a little under a month more, there will be a masking requirement. Uh, it might be extended even longer than that because, after all, you know, safety is uh, you know a big concern. And I have to tell you, the average trip length of a of a uh, ride is 11 minutes or something. So it can be shorter than 11 minutes. It could be maybe a little longer than 11 minutes. The CDC's guidelines back at the height of COVID was to not uh, stay in an enclosed space for you know, more than 15 minutes. So the exciting thing about my ride is that you're in the bus for a shorter period of time than most people are going to the grocery store. So it's you know really not as long as you're masked, it's not a. And they and they stuff. made it a rule that if you go on the but um, if you go on the but I mean you can have like your computer bag, but you have to not have so much. Be I think is it because of COVID, like carrying so much on a bus? Is there a rule? Well, you can bring um, you know for instance if you go shopping and you have a trolley cart, um, you can definitely. Oh, uh, shopping cart. Yeah. Shopping cart. Yeah, a little. Uh, I call them shopping trolleys. So I have one I use all the time. Uh, and uh, so you can, uh, you can bring one of those on the bus. You just have to secure it so that it's not in the way of someone or rolling around uh, the bus. Mm -hmm. So you can carry things on the bus. Any, go ahead. Yes. Yeah, um, um, you got 10 minutes left. Take your time. Okay, can you repeat the question? Okay, I'm going to repeat the question one last time. <laughs> Sorry. We can re edit this. Um, if you're blind or losing hair or hard of hearing, uh, oh. what do you So, what accommodations? What, yeah, yeah oh, okay, okay, we, okay, I pretty much understand. What accommodations? Is there like any. Like for for people that are deaf and hard of hearing, is there a TTY service for the my ride? Number? Yes, there. I believe that. Thank there you. Is. Yes, thank, thank you, you, Arlene. Arlene. And and Arlene, I wanted to finish the question about um, access to transit phones because we never finished that. So um, just this past week, I was talking with um, the Trans, which is the Agency of Transportation, uh, one of the public transit coordinators, and um, about. Uh, getting transit phones installed. And it turns out that there's federal money uh, for this purpose and that um, the uh, Green Mountain Transit will be responsible for um, you know, asking for the, that funding. But the Agency of Transportation will support uh, Green Mountain Transit in any way that they can to help locate phones at the appropriate place. So, so that's a there big would be step like forward. A, so you would open up a latch, the phone would be there, 
pick up the phone? It probably would be like a, a pay phone almost, and it would just be a box with a, a, an old-fashioned uh, cord and handle, and you would just pick up the phone, and when the call center is there, you would you would dial right to the call center, and you could talk with them. They had, they had almost something similar up at the hospital, like if you needed a cab. Yes, the hospital, and we don't have to put a transit phone at the hospital because in the lobby at the Central Mont Hospital, there is a, um, a just next to where the um, gift shop is, there's a, a phone right there that you can use. Um, it's against the wall, it's a great unit, and um, so that's always there if you're at the hospital. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the challenges that we have, unfortunately, is the fact that worldwide there is a scarcity, there's a shortage of CDL drivers and... I was going to ask, yeah. what is, I'm sorry to piggyback off your question, but what is, what are the major challenges, we got time, what are the major challenges around transportation and people with special needs? And right. you were going to go ahead. Well, I, I, you know, I think, I think we should be so proud because, you know, we, uh, so many times we're, we're trained to complain about things, and I just want to <laughs> I just want to give GMT credit because yeah. this is the first. So the software provider that does the app is called Via. They're from um, down Boston, and they have um, people that work for them worldwide. They have worldwide services, but this is the the first time that they've really worked in with a um, an operator. Because oftentimes they work privately with people. They have, they're not public transit oriented. This is the first time that they've had to work with anybody, uh, any group that has a strong union component. And so GMT um, and their uh, driver union work very closely together. The drivers get breaks. They get lunch breaks. Mm -hmm. They get all sorts of things that private drivers uh, using the app on a different system would not get. So that has impacted our learning curve on how to always have availability. But the, the challenge is that there just aren't enough people driving now. And we would have extended hours if we had drivers. Mm. And so, for instance, when I talk about the phone at the hospital, I think about people who go up for um, during the day, they take my ride up and they're in the emergency room, but then they get out after six o'clock, there isn't a my ride to take them back home. And if we could get more drivers, so our bottleneck is drivers. If we could find more drivers to drive, then there's money for extended hours. We just don't have drivers. So, you know, but this is not just my ride's issue. This is the, an issue all over. So then there's been a discussion of, well, could smaller vans be used, uh, you know, who, that don't require CDL drivers? And it's the same challenge. There just aren't people interested in driving the way they that uh, we used And to. you can't get a volunteer driver? Um, no, volunteer drivers uh, are used in some aspects uh, of the GMT system uh, to help move people who need to go to like Dartmouth-Hitchcock, uh, and, and back and forth. That's a whole different system, but that really wouldn't work on a long-term basis because it's a big responsibility driving human beings around. You know, it's not like your FedEx or UPS where you're driving packages around. You're actually driving humans. So, uh, you know, it, it, it's a big responsibility. And people would want to be compensated. Yes, exactly. Is there anything? Uh, so I just wanted to say that, that we started up an ad campaign in uh, the Montpelier Bridge. And so uh, we have had two, let's see, so the first one was the March 9th, March 22nd bridge. And we had this wonderful um, ad, which is um, uh, a rider. Uh, and she's got, um, my ride picks me up where I am and takes me where I want to go, when I want to get there. And, um, and then, of course, one of the things that's happened is that the gas prices are going up so high. And so our, our ad in this, um, this issue of the bridge is my ride. High gas prices got you down. 
take my ride for free today. So we're just trying to encourage people to try my ride during this crisis so that they can just leave their car at home and you know not worry about these short trips around town. And the other thing I wanted to say, Larry, is that Lawrence, is that it turns out that 50% of trips taken in the United States are three miles or less. Mm. So the MyRide system really is designed just for that. It's for little local you know, uh, trips around town. And so it's really designed to help with that. Anything we didn't mention, we have a couple of minutes left. Sure. Uh, yeah, so that, I mean, that's one of them. It, that, then, um, uh, I really think that GMT, you talked about uh, people with disabilities. I have to say that uh, GMT is really amazing about um, working with anybody who needs wheelchair access. Um, there are lifts on all the buses. Uh, however, when you make your call or you go online or you use your smartphone, you really need to make sure that you say that you need um, lift assistance uh, to get into the bus because that takes a certain amount of time and that has to be factored into the scheduling. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, GMT is, is amazing in the way in which they accommodate people with disabilities. Um, and I think once transit pones are in place, then the, the issue of universal access will be really... Um, Complete. Anything else you want to add? Yeah. Um, I like to see the buses going longer. Yeah. It, is there any point where there will be longer um, days, especially in the summertime with the trips, or is it going to stop at 5-something? So, it, so it stops at 6 o'clock now. So the schedule now runs from uh, Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. to 6 p.m., and on Saturday, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. Uh, Arlene, if we had drivers, we could extend those hours. But until such time as, you know, we wave a magic wand and all over the world more drivers appear, <laughs> you know, but it's, it's a real challenge. It's a challenge in Europe. It's a challenge in Asia. It's a challenge with uh, truckers, you know, it's not just uh, bus drivers, but it's also truckers. So it's a huge issue that we're having to face uh, worldwide, and and we have yet to crack the key and you know figure out how to uh, to get more people interested in doing this. I think that the GMT bus drivers are like echo warriors. They're like they're shifting. Uh, how we use gas, how we, how we uh, do transportation, and uh, they really are, in my opinion, the you know, e ecological heroes of our time. But nobody talks about them that way except me. <laughs> mm. Well, we would like to thank, um, uh, we would like to thank you, Elizabeth Parker, uh, from the um, Sustainable Montpelier Coalition for joining us on Ableton On Air. Uh, for more information on booking a ride on GMTA, you can, and my ride, you, you can go to um, the number 802-223-7287. That number, once again, is 802-223-7287 or www.gmta. I think it's I think it's GMT, isn't GMT? it? GMT. Hold on a second. Let's just look that one up org. too. I'm sorry. <laughs> no dot org. Dot com. And I think they're dot com. It's, okay. it's GMT dot com. Right, okay. right, Arlene? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that number once again is eight oh two 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 three. 7287. What is the website for the Montpelier, Sustainable Montpelier Coalition? So we're sustainablemontpelier.org. Okay. Yeah. And more information on the Sustainable Montpelier Coalition, you can go to www.sustainablemontpelier.org. And we would like to thank again uh, Elizabeth Parker from the Sustainable Montpelier Coalition for joining us on Ableton On Air. Thank you to our sponsors. Green Mountain Support Services, Washington County Mental Health, the Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired of, of Vermont, and partnering with the uh, with um, DVBI of Vermont as well. 
and many, many, many others. Um, the uh, website is www.ridegmt.com. That's ridegmt.com and 802-223-7287. Thank you. See you next time. I'm Lon Seiler. I'm Lon Seiler. <laughs> See you next time on the next edition of Ableton On Air. Major sponsors for Ableton On Air include Green Mountain Support Services, Empowering people with disabilities to live home in the community. Washington County Mental Health, where hope and support come together. Media sponsors for Able and On Air include Parkchester Times, Muslim Community Report, www.thisisthebronx.info, Associated Press Media Editors, New York Parrot Online Newspaper, U.S. Press Corps, Domestic and International, Anchor FM, and Spotify. Partners for Ableton On Air include Yihad of New York and New England, where everyone belongs, the Orthodox Union, the Division for the Blind and Visually Impaired of Vermont, the Vermont Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired, Central Vermont Habitat for Humanity, and Montpelier Sustainable Coalition, Montefiore Medical Center of the Bronx, Rose F. Kennedy Center of Bronx, New York, Albert Einstein College of Medicine of the Bronx. Able Then On Air has been seen in the following publications, Parchester Times, www.thisisthebronx.com, New York Pirate Online Newspaper, Muslim Community Report, www.h.com, and the Montpelier Bridge. Ableton On Air is part of the following organizations. The National Academy of Television Arts and Sciences, Boston, New England Chapter, and the Society of Professional Journalists.